Welcome to Ultra Retrospective, a personal journey of mine to go back and revisit all the shows in the Ultraman series to see if I think they still hold up. It had to happen eventually, but today begins my coverage of the current era of Ultraman. From 2013 to present, Tsuburaya gave the world a new show every year, starting with Ultraman Ginga and its sequel season, Ginga S. Out of interest in not giving off the wrong impression, and wanting to beat all the commenters to the punch, I don't dislike New Generation Ultraman. In fact, it has more hits than misses. And this is speaking as someone who's watched everything from the very beginning chronologically. I feel comfortable saying that some of these shows range from decent to exemplary. Which isn't to imply I see no fault in the fundamental issues every show during this era shares. To save you the time, since you might have already heard it all, those issues stem from more toyetic transformation gimmicks, an over-reliance on familiar kaiju to such a degree it makes every subsequent appearance less special, and a litany of other issues I'll throw at you later, when they're relevant to bring up. But I do think, even with all those persistent issues weighing every new generation entry down, they are still capable of some truly standout episodes. And the best shows rise above my grievances and make for some of the most approachable entries in the franchise's history. The fact that every show is in the ballpark of 25 to 26 episodes helps mitigate the filler seen during the Showa and early Heisei era. This is the ideal length for an Ultraman show. It also makes my job easier because there's less I have to watch. Kidding aside, we're starting with the beginning of an era here, and it starts on uneven terrain. Tsuburaya was owned by Bandai now, and they weren't willing to spend more than zero dollars on a new show. They weren't sure how this new, more toy-focused approach to an Ultra series was going to turn out. I'll be taking a look at Ginga first, then its second season. They're different enough to justify two videos, but I think it'll be more interesting to compare and contrast them in a single video. It's been 10 years since this new generation of Ultraman began with Ginga's first season. So let's see if it started with a bang. Spoiler warning, it did not. I mean, explosions were involved, but you know what I mean. In a universe separated from the Showa timeline, the show follows Hikaru Raido, a high schooler hanging out with his friends in a small town during summer vacation. After arriving, he's promised an adventure by a tiny Ultraman Taro toy. Okay, so explanation here. At some point in the past, the Land of Light was attacked by a force created by an entity named Dark Lugiel. With his power, he subjected the Ultraman and a number of kaiju to a fate worse than death transformation into marketable toys called spark dolls. These five-inch toys somehow transcended dimensions and traveled to Hikaru's alternate Earth, where Lugiel uses them to annoy a small town. With the power of the Ginga Spark, owned by Lugiel's light counterpart, a hero from the future named Ultraman Ginga, Hikaru is able to take on the monstrous forms of the spark dolls he finds, in addition to Ginga himself. Extremely mundane shenanigans ensue for another 11 episodes, where some cartoonishly evil ruffian is given the power to transform into the monster of the week, or one of Hikaru's friends is threatened by a depression that's used to motivate them to become the monster of the week. All of his friends eventually find out that he's Ginga as well, so that's new. Heck, there's no attack team in this show. That would be like, the first time ever, I think. At least since the final arc of Leo. Ha ha ha! Ginga sees some of the lowest visible production values out of any mainline Ultra series. And I'm talking in regards to the time it was made. It should look better than it does. <laughs> the main setting is a small town and a primary shooting location is what appears to be an actual school. It seems like unmiked onset audio was used for a number of scenes. Day for Night is used in one episode. Many of its monster fights take place on the same forest set with a basic sky background. 
I could sit here all day pointing out the shortcomings, but the point is that they didn't have a lot of money for the show, which was out of the showrunner's control. So a lot of that can be forgiven, it's only fair to judge how well it carries itself with those limitations. While it has a number of awkward moments, the show can be admirable with its framing and blocking at times. The reveal of Tiga Dark here is cleverly shot. It's proof that the staff knew what they were doing. And while this smaller scale could hypothetically make for some fun character-based drama, especially with the lack of an attack team to fall back on for episode premises, the execution here is often lacking. The cast of Ginga isn't awful, but they're not what I would call fully dimensional. They each have some little episode-length conflicts that are resolved by the power of friendship. Oh yeah, Taro is a character in this show too, a reasonably prominent one at that. He didn't exactly have much of a personality when separated from Kotaro, so the show puts him in goofy situations stemming from his reduced size. These scenes are kind of entertaining. And Hikaru, the protagonist, isn't exactly winning any awards. The most I can say about him is that he gets upset on his friend's behalf, but he doesn't have much of a unique personality to call his own, at least in this first season. There is a theme present throughout the show where every character has a dream they aspire to, which is something, I guess. And Hikaru as Ginga aims to protect his friend's dreams, too? It's a functional enough message, I guess, but I can barely conjure the words to say I thought it was compelling. The fact that I have to call it functional speaks to how much I felt for it. And it didn't need to be like that. The contrast of older characters, whose dreams were dashed, with the younger characters, who are still hopeful, is there. Ginga being from the future reinforces this idea, and that could have been interesting in a better show. There is something to be said about the concept of a show about a group of friends just hanging out, and the monster attacks being the result of interpersonal drama, and you know, Taro being here is a fun bonus. There is a nice setup here, it's just not very well realized. I don't really like any of these characters. The character melodrama that makes up this show's storylines isn't terribly compelling. It's usually quite petty and contrived, actually. An example, in one episode, Kenta gets salty about his friends seemingly not paying attention to him. There's like one scene of him walking in on them discussing Hikaru's Ultraman identity that he mistakes as them keeping secrets from him. So he instantly turns to the dark side and wants to destroy the entire town. Like, yeah, he was possessed by the dark spark or whatever, but it's embarrassing to even consider this a conflict for a second. It lasts like five minutes before the episode stumbles into the real plot. I just can't buy into what the show presents as a conflict. For what it's worth, I think Ginga the Ultra is pretty cool. The glowing cyan adds a surprising amount to what could have just been a basic Ultraman design. It's familiar but distinct. Ginga also makes use of elemental powers in the show, a fireball and a lightning attack. I bring this up now because it's important for the Ginga S segment. Interestingly, it takes until episode 5 for his color timer to start beeping. Before then, he was able to deal with the monsters in a timely manner. It speaks to how lackadaisical this format is. There aren't that many new kaiju or aliens in the show. I can see why this wouldn't be an issue for people who haven't seen the shows these monsters are from, but speaking as someone who was, at the time I watched Ginga, fresh off of seeing three movies, three television shows, and several side stories that prominently featured returning kaiju, it was already starting to feel a little stale having to see Red King again. For me, this show was the breaking point where it started to get tired. It was, again, born from a lack of budget to make new monsters. I don't object to seeing a familiar monster if their reappearance is fun. Max and Mebius had plenty of great examples. 
but to see them so far removed from their original context for stories this mundane and with stakes this low, it makes their usage feel all the more trite. Pandon here could have been exchanged for any other monster and nothing about the story would have been different. Unless you want to consider it a metaphor for the fact that it's a two-headed monster being used by a two-faced character, but I don't think the show is smart enough for that to be intentional. Later New Generation shows kind of have the same problem with their returning aliens, but at least in those, their usage can be so absurd that they become entertaining in a different way. Dark Lugia is also just Belial with less personality. You can't just introduce a new, dark McEvil guy like this and not be subject to comparisons, especially right after a series of films and specials focusing on Belial. Even Dark Luigi's subordinate, Alien Valky, has more of a presence, and he's Alien Valky. Um, Beauty Bubble. It's a light-hearted show, but I don't think it's able to consistently pull off the tone it's going for. It utilizes a lot of stilted slapstick made all the more awkward by sped-up footage rather than letting it be naturally funny. Sped-up footage with goofy sound effects is just cringeworthy to me. Don't get me wrong, this show can be amusing, but it's very clearly aiming for a younger demographic. It's not really capable of the same general audience enjoyment that a lot of other Ultra shows have. Very much juvenile in the worst ways. It's a childish tone that carries over into the aforementioned theme of protecting everyone's dreams. It's told in a very rudimentary and direct way that doesn't compel. Ginga's sillier moments happening within the same episode as the melodrama makes it feel all the more insincere as well. Okay, so Ginga implemented its toyetic gimmick in the most blunt, graceless fashion possible. Remember the whole toys to life craze? You know, when a new video game would release in tandem with a toy line and buying the toys separately would unlock new content. You know, your Disney Infinities, Skylanders, whatever. Well, the show kinda had something like that. The Spark Dolls, in addition to being incredibly affordable 5-inch figures that don't scale with the rest of my collection, they can be scanned over the real-life Ginga Spark and I guess it would say the monster's name? A cool enough toy if you're seven years old and playing pretend during recess, but this isn't a toy review channel, yet. I'm judging how this element impacts the show, and it really is intrusive. But before I really dig into it, let's be real. The Ultra series has always had toyetic elements to some degree, with the Ultraman transformation devices finding new and colorful shapes, and the monsters almost always got a toy made of them. But I hesitate to call this soulless, because the monsters we got out of it were really unique and fun. We also got some crappy ones, but I can forgive that. And with the rare exception of a monster toy being seen in the background, which, you know, poor taste considering what these monsters do, there was an in-universe separation between the explicitly marketable toys and the kaiju. It's not exactly perfect with that separation, it can get pretty blatant with just how connected the two could get at times, but there's just something about how Ginga does it that makes my skin crawl. Ginga was not the first to mingle these two elements, with Mega Monster Battle's gamified Battleizer being where I think it truly began. But the fact that the monsters and heroes here are literally summoned through the toys feels weirdly chintzy and cheap. At least Mega Monster Battle had the excuse of being a spin-off and a video game adaptation. And don't get me wrong, I know why they had to do this. Those older Heisei shows constantly bled money, and Mebius was purposefully made for a loss because Tsuburaya, as it was, knew they weren't going to be around for much longer, so they wanted to go out with a bang. But seeing a mainline entry stoop to this level, it's lame. That's why I think the toyetic gimmick in Ginga just doesn't feel right. There's also just an inherent comedy to me of a monster being defeated and it hard cuts to a toy hitting the ground. That's what they've been reduced to. I still bought a handful of these, so I don't know, maybe I'm part of the problem. 
They're still super affordable and reasonably detailed figures. Like, seriously, you can get some of these for five bucks a pop. But, uh, yeah, not a huge fan of them in the show. The fact that Ginga himself requires a spark doll makes him no more special conceptually than the other Ultramen. Like, if Hikaru had that Ultraman Tiga spark doll from the beginning, this would be another Tiga show. Know what I mean? <laughs> There was fun to be had with Ginga during my rewatch. Some of the fight scenes can be quite enjoyable. Sometimes the humor got a chuckle out of me. And on occasion, the cast riled some emotion from me. There is something of a chaotic approach in the latter half where a whole smorgasbord of foes from different eras show up, and the stakes naturally get a little higher, which makes for some decent entertainment. <laughs> I still don't really care for the characters at this point, but I won't deny that there was a goofy grin on my face during some of these sillier action set pieces. Even the show's opening is infectious. I don't have much to say about the soundtrack, it's kinda bland, but that opening is a bop. The way it's used during the show's climactic moments is even surprisingly hype. Like, wow, that's kind of fucking awesome. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't moved by the scene in the final episode where Taro regains his giant form, too. That's great. But that's all I can really give Ginga. It has some cool moments, but ultimately felt hollow to me because I just can't get into the characters and their petty melodrama. As much fun as that final episode is, I can't forget the rest of the show. I didn't like it when I first saw it, and I still don't. As bad as a lot of Ginga is, it's at the very least an interesting case study. This is what a modern Ultraman show on a severely limited budget looks like. The state of things were so dire for Ginga that it has worse production values than the Heisei shows from a decade prior. For as much as it gets wrong in other areas, I can't in good conscience be too hard on it. At worst, it's a mediocre show with the unfortunate baggage of a low budget. I have no such sympathy for Ginga S. A year later, Tsuburaya produced this second season, and this time they actually had money for it. For one, they can actually afford an attack team this time. All three members of it. Okay, it's a step away from what I've come to expect, but it's a start. It's been two years since the events of the first season. Hikaru regains the ability to become Ginga when a new foe in the form of Alien Jibol threatens to steal the power source of an underground civilization. This civilization is named the Victorians. Yes, that's what they're called. They have an Ultraman of their own. His name is Victory. You can tell that's his name because he has V's all over his body. While antagonistic at first, Victory's host, a man named Sho, eventually warms up to Hikaru, and they work together to fight Chibol with the power of green screens and increasingly elaborate power-ups. Oh yeah, Hikaru joins the attack team UPG at some point, too. The presentation here, while not quite where it would be by the next show, is a step above the production values of the first season. Ginga no longer spins during his rise sequence, and instead does a more standard one. The Taro theme plays during the show's recaps, though this is more of a nod to the fact that Taro is on Hikaru's wrist now. The show isn't Taro-centric, so the use of the theme is more like set dressing. Of course, the cast is a lot larger too. Sho as a secondary protagonist and brief antagonist is... I mean, I guess his actor is good in the role? I once again can't really summon enough of an opinion. His rival archetype has been done much better before. He's straight up told to not harm the lives of those who live above ground, yet he immediately starts shit with Hikaru and Ginga. That whole conflict feels a tad contrived, and sets the stage for a character I'm destined to not really care about. 
Sho has to learn the power of friendship, yada yada yada. It's so played out by now. UPG being as small as it is does make the characters stick out more, I guess. There's Serious Lady. There's the hothead third wheel. Yeah, nah, none of these guys are archetypes that haven't been done better. There is the returning Atomaya from the first season. He acts as their scientist. I at least recognize him. The whole element of him helping Hikaru hide his Ultraman identity is amusing for the single scene they do it in. I don't know, the return of the attack team is nice, but the characters who make it up don't interest me. They're super one note. They dive into two of them later in the show, but I still don't really care that much. I had more to say about the cast in the last season, who do return for a couple one-off episodes. Chibul at least makes for a more fun antagonist than Dark Linguini. He makes liberal use of other languages, which is at least funny to hear. Just like his Showa-era counterpart, Chibul's got an android lady subordinate and... Whoa, uh, I see how it is. She eventually has a change of heart, or whatever, I really don't fucking care. No! The show wasn't able to grab me with its characters, new or old, and in consequence I can't really muster the strength to care about the storylines that happen later. There's one that kinda gets close with this Victorian from the past named Hiyori, who harbors generations of hatred for seemingly being cast out of the old society for her abilities. There's even an extended shot at the end of the episode where she tears up as she's eating a candy bar Hikaru offered her. And I get what they were going for here. It's the first sign of friendship she's received in a very long time. And in a vacuum, this little moment works. I just... <sighs> I don't really care about the elements surrounding her to care. As a side note, they really popped off with the practical effects in this episode, goddamn. Ginga S is much more action-packed than the prior season, and I feel as though it's ultimately to the show's detriment. Part of why those rare, cool moments in the first season worked was because they were saved for the third act of the episode. You can't really build to something like that if the structure of the episode is so loose that a fight scene is happening every other minute. There's a lot more action on both the human and ultra side of things. UPG is kicking ass, Sho is kicking ass, Hikaru is kicking ass, everyone is kicking everyone's ass. It means there's always something happening. And it doesn't always look great. The new miniatures, those are quite good and the choreography during these practical suit sequences is solid. Hell, even the human-sized fights are well done. But it's the digital effects here that are a bit shaky. The beams look pretty good, and so does some of the compositing. For example, the first episode hits the viewer with this incredibly impressive shot of the human cast interacting with the kaiju fight, and there are a number of decent shots like this throughout the show. But several shots during kaiju fights take place on top of photos of real places, and these just look ugly. Sometimes the fake digital camera shakes reveal portions of the black background, on top of making an already ugly shot look uglier. The digital effects here are overall a mixed bag. And that's a messy bag to have, considering there are a lot of them in this show. If it's any concession, they must have realized how awful these looked, so they stopped using the green screen as frequently from episode 5 onward. Yeah! The pacing and escalation of the show's conflict doesn't feel natural. Episode 3 has this massive invasion with a billion robots, and it feels like a scope that should have been saved for the show's finale. It got too big too fast. Combine that with the other fight scenes happening constantly and it all starts to feel like grey mush. I didn't bring it up during the segment talking about Season 1, but Ginga introduced these cutaways to the kaiju or Ultraman host inside the sort of slip space so that they can converse with other characters. Conceptually, I guess this is fine if you want to show the characters reacting to something. Ginga S does a lot of this too, and it became an excuse to halt the action for up to 15 seconds just to show a transformation within the slip space. Back in the day, it was as simple as holding the transformation devices aloft and it would be over in at most 10 seconds. 
Now they have to do this whole choreographed dance and then they transform. It shoots the pacing in the foot and the fact that it started here, in a show with two Ultramen, therefore necessitating showing them both doing it. It just makes me groggy. They do simplify these scenes eventually because even they realized showing it every time would be redundant. I just wish they were able to convey the gravitas of an Ultraman transformation without stopping the episode for it. It would get even worse in later shows, with some transformations lasting as long as 30 seconds. These at least happen in overall better shows, though. Worst case scenario, these scenes start and I dedicate that time to looking at Discord or something. It's hard to not look at Ginga S with contempt for going overboard on how frequently these scenes occur, though. These just compound an already bad pacing problem. I'm not gonna go through the whole reason I oppose this approach to merchandising again, but I will mention that they introduced more gimmicks in this season that make it arguably worse. Remember how I brought up Ginga's fireball and lightning attacks? Yeah, he doesn't use them very often here. Instead, he's replaced them with this wheel Taro gave him that lets him use another Ultra's beam attack, despite already having a perfectly fine one of his own. They make it a point to show how his fireball attack doesn't work on the enemy, which necessitates using his objectively better new toy. He gets this in episode 3, by the way. It's way too early to feel earned. You know you've fucked up when the viewer's reaction to a new gadget isn't, cool, a new power-up, and is instead, oh my god, that means more particle effects, please just fucking end me now. Victory also makes use of spark dolls to attach different things to his arm, and these require more cutaways. All of this overstimulation and loud sound effects and crazy beam locks makes this show surprisingly boring. It's fine if this balls-to-the-wall tone and pacing were in, say, a 90-minute feature film, I'm getting specific here because that's what the series director did before this, but an entire show operating on that gear is just exhausting, especially when the little story it does tell is predictable. Episode 4 sees Sho doubting the power of friendship, so he discards his spark dolls and tries to fight the monster without them, which goes poorly until his friend Shepardon shows up, and one of the other Victorian pals shows up to give him back his toys. The message here is that he needs to learn how to rely on others, but the meta reading of this is that he can't win without the show's gimmicks. Relying on others isn't even a bad message to have, if all that was here was him learning to rely on Ginga and his friends, it wouldn't be a problem, but the spark dolls being here muddies the point and makes it about the toys. Even when Shepardon dies later in the show, spoilers, he lives on as a new toy for Victory to use. It's so unsubtle about it. At the end of the day, this show is about the characters and they are responsible for moving the story along. The show isn't so vapid that it moves on regardless of them, but I just don't really care for them. I'm not really endeared by their escapades. For as much shit as I give it, the show does have two decent episodes. In the first one, an overworked salary man gets trapped in the body of Gonku and befriends a kid he was previously mean to. And it becomes something of a surrogate father figure for him. It's surprisingly sweet. It's nice getting an episode that focuses on two characters outside of the main cast. It tells a nice little story with a beginning, middle, and end. Even some of the comedy works. The episode that directly follows this one is also shockingly good. A character from the previous season named Chikusa returns, having fulfilled her dream of being an idol. Things take a funny turn when it's revealed that one of her fans is Alien Metron, who's kinda got a Kaiketsu Zubat fit going on. It's weird that this is the first show where Metron isn't a bad guy, and that it's like this, but it's entertaining. Problematic real-life circumstances of the culture aside, the whole idol element lends this episode a fun premise. It's well shot, like seriously, they go hard on some of these sequences, one of them being a long take that lasts over a minute long. 
and it prominently features the first season's theme being sung diegetically. It's a rare spot for Ginga S, a legitimately entertaining episode. So, uh, do you think Metron is more of a Love Live or Idol Master guy? I hope neither. It's no coincidence that the two best episodes of the show don't focus on the overarching story. They're self-contained and, despite being so goofy, feel the most like traditional Ultraman episodes. It's unfortunately back to business as usual for the final four episodes, though I guess the show has found a better groove by now. I'd be more excited about this if the show wasn't going nuts with all the fight scenes from the start. It doesn't feel like there's been an escalation in the action. They go back to using the ugly green screens too, so I have to retract what I said about them realizing it looked bad. The design of Lugiel's more dinosaurian form is kinda cool, I guess. The real highlight is the incredibly flamboyant alien Zeton in episode 14, though. A bite. Ginga S. More like Ginga sucks. Haha, <laughs> got him. I'm tired. If this review in particular seems a bit more chaotic and repetitive, consider that representative of the show. I take no pleasure in being mean to Ginga S, but I seriously just don't like it. At least the first season was more traditional. It wasn't very good, but at least it wasn't trying to grab the viewer's attention every 20 seconds. Ginga S had much more money to throw around and was spent on something way noisier. It's just noise. Noise, 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 noise. Let me put it into perspective. I blasted through the first season in a day. And yes, it was cringeworthy at times. But it was so fascinating as a case study of what happens when you have no money to make an Ultraman show. Ginga S genuinely felt like a chore to get through. I know the fandom narrative is that Ginga S is an improvement over the first season, and I won't deny that. It is, technically speaking. The presentation is much more slick. But I don't know, I think I might hate it more. I personally find its approach to pacing boring and overstimulating. I still don't like the characters that much. It has only two good episodes. There are some genuinely great little bits of tokusatsu sprinkled in there, but there are just too many fight scenes and very little to care about. It's understandable if someone finds more enjoyment in this than the first season, but I personally just couldn't find it within myself to care about it. Neither season is good. I would not recommend Ginga. Not really the fault of the show, but for whatever reason VLC crashed my whole computer as I was watching this on three separate occasions. It's like it didn't want to even play the show. I had to switch over to MPC HC for the first time ever. Didn't get any crashes there. So yeah, this is where the current era of Ultraman began. Not the best first impression, but it did get a lot better from here. The follow-up, Ultraman X, isn't perfect. It's got a couple of the same issues that plagued Ginga S, but for whatever reason, I don't really mind them as much there. It probably helps that it has a better cast, and it utilizes its returning kaiju much better, while telling more traditional Ultraman stories. It manages to have a number of pretty decent episodes. That's a video for another time, though. There's also a Ginga S movie, but I don't feel as inclined to cover that. It's more or less a celebration of the Heisei era of Ultraman, and it's fun for that, I suppose. It's the beginning of a tradition where almost every show would get a theatrical film that's more or less just an extended episode, featuring a cameo from another Ultraman. This would be a thing for the next five shows before Zet broke the streak by not having one. I mean, fair, that was a COVID show. But yeah, Ginga and Ginga S. Not recommended. But sometimes it takes a really rough start to get somewhere good. They were ultimately worth the hassle. Hey, thanks for making it to the end of the video, and withstanding my voice for 34 minutes. I don't know what the final time on this thing is going to be. I really think I was... 
meter than usual on this video, and I just want to reiterate that I take no pleasure in being negative about a show. In fact, videos like these are harder to work on because I have to hear myself being negative for hours at a time. But at the end of the day, I want to express my opinion on something. I don't want to lie and say I enjoyed something when I, I didn't. I just, I just don't want to lie to myself. You know, this is how I feel about a show. Anyways, here is a shout out to the top patrons who helped make videos like this one possible. Swoosh McJuice. Navek15. Jacob Hinch. Dude Bro. Griffith J. Hertenstein, Alastair Gilmore, Seamus Kelly, Anonymous Euronymous 1349, Cantapat Youngvenich, Fujoshi Urinal, Mulan Nguyen, Ultraman Taro vs. Leo, Irrelevant 402, Hey I'm Mooney, Krazak 53, Komen, Queer Kaiju, Chronicler Wava, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avak Robot, The Antagonist, Richard Ciavardon, It's God Z, Big Odilo, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you all very much.